Okay, so we were, we were just talking about things that are reabsorbed, secreted, and filtered, and we are talking about how you know if it's been filtered, reabsorbed, or secreted. So if you look at the GFR, what's GFR stand for? Glomerular filtration rate. If you look at the GFR, if the plasma clearance, which is the amount of plasma cleared of a substance per unit of time, if the GFR is exactly the same as the plasma, the only thing that happened was what process? If the filtration rate was the same, what was the only thing that happened? If the amount that you filter is the same, what was the only process that happened? Filtration. So if you're only filtering, the filtration rate, the GFR, is exactly the same as clearance. What happens to this rate compared to GFR if you start reabsorbing things back into the blood? Does the number go up higher than GFR or does it go down lower? You're looking at the amount of particles or the amount of substance that you're, you're pushing through. So if you're reabsorbing it, are you going to see as much in the urine? No, because you're reabsorbing it. If you're secreting it, what would happen to that number? Would it go over GFR or under GFR? It would go over because you're pushing more stuff into the kidney. So those are the three properties. And I gave you examples of each, like um, inulin and creatinine were examples of things that are filtered, so we can use that as a measuring rate for GFR. If we can count the number of particles of inulin or the number of particles of creatinine, creatinine we know exactly how fast you're filtering things. Just filtering, because that's it. But with PAH, your body hates this stuff. It's going to filter and it's going to secrete as much as possible. So would, what would you expect GFR to be, or sorry, the clearance rate to be? Higher or lower than GFR? If it hates it, tries to filter it, tries to secrete it, and do everything it can to get rid of it. It's going to be way greater. Yeah. So it's actually about 625 milliliters per minute. It's pretty high, extremely high. What was the rate for GFR? 125 milliliters per minute. So if we measure how much creatinine is in your urine, and we measure how much PAH is in your urine, we can actually determine the filtration fraction. And if you do the math, the GFR being what, what number? 125, and then renal plasma flow is determined by PAH, that's 625. 125 divided by 625 is 0.20. So what percent is that? 0.20 converted to a percent is 20%. So on average, your kidneys should be filtering about 20% of the blood going through, which is the filtration fraction. All right, these terms you've seen before, if you don't remember them, you should kick yourself in the, your own ass. Right. ISO means what? same. Isotonic means that this substance is the same as the blood. And the number or the value you need to remember now is 300 milliosmoles. You can just remember 300 particles per liter is the way I like to think of it. Because not most people think milliosmoles in their mind. But if you think about 300 particles of something in water, that's isotonic to the blood. So what would hypotonic be? Would you add more or less of this particle? Yep, you would add less. Wait, wait, wait. So, yeah, you're right, less particles. I was looking at the water. So you have less particles, which means it's what? More concentrated or more dilute? It's more dilute. It's more watered down. And then hypertonic means you raise the solutes, which is what? More concentrated or dilute? Concentrated. What? If you had a very hypertonic situation going on in the kidney, what color would you expect your urine to be? darker yellow. If it were very hypotonic, which means you have lots of water flowing through, what would you expect your urine to be? Very clear, less color. And then isotonic a normal tone to it. All right, this is a concept you have to under know and understand. There are three things I'm going to have you underline here. So first, when you're looking at the renal medulla, the cortex stays isotonic to the, the rest of the blood. So what number would you associate with the cortex? 300. The cortex stays at about 300. But when you look at the medulla, the medulla gets more and more concentrated the deeper you get into it. So what's going to happen to the number the deeper you get? Will the number get smaller for milliosmoles or bigger? If it's more concentrated, bigger because you want it to be more hypertonic. So it starts at 300 where it borders the cortex and it goes down to 1200 when it gets deeper and deeper and deeper down in the medulla. Right. So the first thing that they call this is the medullary countercurrent system. It's the medulla concentrating the urine. And what does it are the long loops of Henle. So the first thing we're underline is that the long loops of Henle establish 
this gradient. It's because of the long loops. The longer the loop, the steeper the gradient. We talked about that first day of renal. I said that the cortical nephrons are really short. They don't do much concentrating, but the long juxtamedullary, the ones with the long loop of Henle, do more concentrate. And I gave you the example of the kangaroo rat. So it's the long loop of Henle that actually establishes this gradient. And they call it the vertical osmotic gradient. Right. Second thing to analyze is the vasorecta. The vasorecta prevents it from breaking apart. All the vasorecta does is maintain that gradient. It doesn't create it, it just maintains it. So the way your book words is vasorecta prevents the dissolution of the gradient while providing blood to the medulla. So in other words, it preserves it. It keeps the kidney alive. And the last part are the collecting tubules. So the collecting tubules use that gradient with hormones to try and concentrate or modify your concentrating urine. And I'll show you how each of these work. So three things to know there. You're talking about the collecting ducts, the vasorecta, and the loop of Henle, and what each of them do. Right? I don't know how many semesters I taught before I realized this is a kidney sideways. It just looked like a mushroom. So anyway, so when you look at it kind of sideways, here you have the cortex up at the surface, 300 milliosmoles, but as you go deeper and deeper down into the medulla, you can see it starts getting more what, hypo or hypertonic? More hypertonic. So if you remember the nephron starts up here, comes way down deep into the medulla and then comes back up. So the loop of Henle of the juxtamedullary nephrons are what do most of the actual concentrating. And the process that these loops of Henle use is a process called countercurrent multiplication. So here's how it works. When you start pushing fluids into, you're pushing into the proximal tubule right away, I already told you, most of the stuff gets pulled up back in. What analogy did I give you? My sister's purse. So you dump things into the proximal tubule. Actually, technically, you dump it into the um, Bowman's capsule. And then it goes into the proximal tubule, and most of it gets pulled back in. So 65% of the salt, roughly 65% of the salt is pulled out right away. And the same thing with the water. So as you keep moving it along, the rest of that 35% is going to get modified. So first it goes in the descending limb. Is salt absorbed in the descending limb? I told you the place you had to memorize where salt is actually moved. Was salt moved in the descending limb? No. Zero is moved in the descending limb, but water does. So in the descending limb, as you're going down, you're pulling water out. You're making that solution more and more hypertonic by leaving the salt and the solute particles in but pulling out the water. You're concentrating it. Right? So it decreases the volume. You're reabsorbing a lot of that water to try and decrease the volume. Remember, you filter about 180 liters a day, but you only urinate out about 1.5 liters. And then the ascending limb, will that allow salt to move? Yep. So it lets salt, sodium move, sodium chloride if you want to think table salt. Let's it move, but water can't move now. So now if you have too much salt in there, it starts pulling some of that salt back in. It leaves other solutes in there. So it'll leave um, some potassium in there. It'll leave acids in there, so hydrogen ions, calcium. Here you're primarily pumping salt and water in these two limbs. Water coming down, salt going back up. And here's how it works. So when it starts pouring into the loop, right now it's isotonic. But what's going to happen are there are two mechanisms and they're on opposite sides. This is the one that's descending. What can move here? Water. This is the ascending. What can move here? Salt. So what happens is the salt starts getting pumped, actively pumped into the tissue. And now you're making this hypertonic. What do you think the water wants to do? Think about it. Where's water want to go? What's it want to chase? It wants to chase the salt. Since you're pushing salt into this tissue, the water's going to start seeping into the tissue to follow it. So what you're actually doing is as you keep pumping over here, you're making this more and more and more concentrated. And you can see the deeper you get down in here, the more salt you're pumping, until finally you have 1,200 down here, and the water just chases it in. So this is establishing that concentration gradient, that vertical osmotic gradient. That's the loop of Henle. What's the name of the blood vessel that's maintaining it through here? So as I start pulling water in here, I'll actually take the water and start pumping it out to the rest of the body, recirculating it really quick. By what blood vessel? What, what special kind of capillary? Capillary. 
It has a special name for the juxtamedullary um, nephrons. It's the two names, and I told you to underline it. The vasorecta, yep. So it's the vasorecta. The vasorecta is exchanging. It's trying to pull that water in and carry the water out right away. The blood's flowing just like a river. It's constantly flowing through there, sweeping along and picking up any excess anything that gets out here. So as you're pushing the water in, it's going to pick up the water and start carrying it off to the rest of the body. It's maintaining that gradient, <laughs> keeping that gradient the way it was. So the loop establishes it, but the vasorecta maintains it. Right? So again, prevents dissolution is the technical term. And here's the vasorecta. So as you can see down here, it's really hypertonic. It's going to start transporting things away from that area to keep it right at that 1200. So it doesn't go back and go back to 300 again, but it also doesn't go up to, to 18 or 2000. It maintains everything. The blood grabs hold of these particles and shuffles them off to the rest of the body where it's needed. That's the vasorecta. Right, so what's true about the osmotic gradient? How about number one? The loop of Henle is permeable to water on the descending limb. Is that true or false? Yeah, I hate it when I start with the true answer. Anyway, so that one's true. The loop of Henle is permeable to water on descending. How about on the ascending? Is it permeable to water? Nope. Ascending is permeable to salt, sodium chloride. Yeah, so number one so far is the right answer, but keep looking. How about number two? What's wrong with number two? Cortex has an osmotic gradient that goes from 300 to 1200 milliosmoles. The cortex is at 300. What goes from 300 to 1200 milliosmoles? The medulla, yep. Number three, the vasorecta created the osmotic gradient. What did it do? It maintained it. And the name associated with the vasorecta is the countercurrent multiplication system. That's the name associated with the long loop of Henle. Okay, Countercurrent exchange is the name associated with vasorecta. It's just exchanging back and forth to carry away anything that slipped. So two, three, and four are wrong. Number one had to be the true answer. All right, here's a hormone. What should you do? Underline it. You've seen this hormone before, too. What's the name of the system that helps regulate this hormone? That I told you would absolutely positively have to know the rest of your medical life. Renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Okay, so aldosterone, first you it's not written here, but where was it from? Do you remember where it was released from? The adrenal glands. Yep. It comes from the adrenal glands. It works on the distal tubule. It modifies that last eight percent of what chemical? What is it regulating? Sodium, right? So you know it regulates that last 8% of sodium. If you need more sodium in your body, aldosterone comes out and absorbs the sodium. What's it do to your blood volume? Increases it because what comes with the sodium? Water. What happens to your blood pressure as a result? Increases. Increases. So what's one reason you would release aldosterone? A drop in blood pressure or blood volume. But this is a sodium-potassium pump. So when you turn aldosterone on, or aldosterone turns on this pump, it's moving sodium, pulling sodium in. What else do you know about it because of what I just said? It's what kind of pump? The sodium potassium pump. What do you know about sodium potassium pumps? As it pulls sodium in, what's it doing to potassium? It's pushing potassium out. So there's another reason you would turn on this pump. There's another reason you release aldosterone other than low blood pressure, low blood volume, or low sodium. What could be happening that you would turn aldosterone on? Well, if it pulls in sodium, we already answered that question. What's the other thing it does? Pushes out potassium. Why would you want to push out potassium? Because you have too much in your blood. Can potassium hurt you? Yes, potassium too much or too little can do what to your heart? Stop it. So aldosterone is regulated by lots of things. High blood pressure, high blood volume, not enough sodium, or too much potassium. When you turn on the pump, the pump's indiscriminate. It automatically moves how many sodiums in? Three. How many potassiums out? Two. It just works like that. 
And then the water typically follows whatever is more movement, which is the sodium. So it chases the sodium in. And then here's where the pumps are turned on, down here. Right, next hormone, vasopressin, also known as ADH. So the sucky thing about some of these hormones is that they have two names. It's because in one situation you had a bunch of cardiovascular people studying this hormone. They labeled it and they published paper and called it vasopressin because it causes blood vessel pressure, constriction. Another group, the uh, urologists or renal people, were studying it and they went, actually this hormone works on the kidney as an antidiuretic hormone. So they called it ADH, antidiuretic hormone. And they published at the same time. So you have the same hormone named by two different groups. You have to remember both names. But the names tell you what they do. Vasopressin looks like a vessel presser, right? So it increases your blood pressure by constricting blood vessels. ADH, antidiuretic hormone, does what? What does a diuretic do? Makes you pee more. So what's an antidiuretic do? Make you pee less. Well, what's all that? where's all that pee going then? I shouldn't use the word pee. Where's all that filtered product that could be pee going? Back in your blood. So by the way, what's that doing to your blood volume? Increasing. What's it do to your blood pressure? Increases it. What did vasopressin do to your blood pressure? The exact same thing. It's the same hormone. They're doing the same effects. They're just doing it through different mechanisms. One's doing it directly on cardiovascular. The other one's doing it on the renal system. All right. Works at the same place as aldosterone, the collecting duct, and distal tubule. Where does it come from? Do you remember where it comes from? Anyone? Anyone? Anyone reading their notes? Hypothalamus. Right. And you remember that because the hypothalamus makes you thirsty and also makes you retain water. It's the hypothalamus. So technically it's made in the hypothalamus and it's released from something called the posterior pituitary, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it later. It's a tricky hormone. Right. And then if you know its final effect is to raise your blood pressure, what would be one thing that causes its release? Low blood pressure. If you know it's increasing your blood volume, what's one thing that could cause its release? Low blood volume. Yep. So hypotension or hypertonicity. What's hypertonicity telling you? Your blood is too thick, has too much solute in it. Why would you, that cause you to retain water? To dilute it, yeah, to bring it back. So hypertonicity and hypotension. And then it's osmoreceptors. What are the osmoreceptors detecting? Hypotension or hypertonicity? Hypertonicity, the water concentration. And then the baroreceptors are detecting pressure, hypotension. Right. And here's how ADH or vasopressin works. So it's a hormone. Hormones are kind of cool when we get to them. We'll talk about this in a lot of detail. But the only way a hormone can work is if there's a receptor for it. So the hormone circulates through the blood, goes everywhere in the body, but it has to find a receptor. When it finds the receptor, where? Where is this receptor at for ADH and vasopressin? Well, what did the last slide tell you? Where does it work? It comes from the hypothalamus and the posterior pituitary. Where does it work at? What part of the nephron? The distal tubule and the collecting duct. So it comes on the distal tubule and collecting duct, the same place that aldosterone works, finds a receptor here, turns on a chemical reaction through something called second messengers, which we'll talk about later, where it's like a domino effect. Dick, 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 and finally it flips the trigger over here. Or like a Rube Goldberg, like in the Goonies, the whole truffle shuffle thing, where it's a chain reaction. And then it flips that switch. Did you watch it? No. Your loss. <laughs> anyway, and then it pumps these little holes. It pops holes over here on the tubule. So now that there are holes here, water can penetrate through. Remember, water can't slide through this membrane because the center of the membrane is what? Hydro. The center of the cell membrane is hydrophobic. It hates water. Water can't slide through. You have to put a protein pore in here for water to move. So you pop these things called aquaporins in and the water starts sliding in. Without vasopressin, you have no holes. Can water move? Nope, can't move. So what's going to happen to your urine if you can't pull that water back in? Are you going to make more or less urine? More. What color is it going to be? Very yellow or very clear? Very clear. It's going to dilute your urine. You're losing lots and lots of water. 
So here's your fun fact for the weekend, a couple days early, but when you drink too much alcohol, how many drinks that would be for you, it blocks the release of vasopressin. It goes into your brain and it stops the hypothalamus from releasing vasopressin. It actually totally screws over the hypothalamus. It affects all four Fs, freezing, feeding, fighting, and yes, beer goggle. So it affects all those things. The whole freezing, if you drink a lot, how do you start feeling? You feel really warm. You start having problems regulating your body temperature, but in reality, what's happening to your body temperature? It's dropping. That's why if you're at a bar and you've had a couple too many drinks, you're like, oh, it's so hot in here, right? And then you go out in the cold and then you freeze to death. Maybe not that extreme, but yeah. So you go out in the cold feeling like you're hot. The other thing it does is it regulates your water. So when you're drinking alcohol, it blocks ADH or vasopressin. If you don't have ADH, what happens to these little holes? They close. They're closed. If there's no ADH or vasopressin, these close. What happens to your ability to re retain water? Less. What happens to your urine output? More. You broke the seal, right? If you measured how much alcohol you bring in compared to the urine you produce, which one do you have more of? The output. Way more urine going out. It's not just because you drank one more beer that you had to pee again. It's because you don't have any ADH. You start urinating. How do you feel the next day? Dehydrated. All right, so here's an example of how this works. In this situation, you have ADH being released. So you bring this along, and then you start pulling more water out, reabsorbing water, and concentrating that urine a little bit more. So you have a more concentrated, darker yellow urine. But then, let's say you drink a few beers, boop, ADH is turned off, no holes. So what happens to your urine? It goes out very dilute. Yeah, you can't pull that water back in. And it blocks it here at the distal tubule and the collecting duct. That's where it's working. All right, so what's true about vasopressin? Which is true about vasopressin? I'm going to impress you with my Spanish. How about number uno? Vasopressin's made in the kidney. Where's it made then? Hypothalamus, released from the posterior pituitary. Number one's wrong. Number two, vasopressin stimulates reabsorption of sodium. What reabsorbs sodium? Aldosterone, right? So number two is wrong because vasopressin reabsorbs water. Number three, vasopressin has another name which is aldosterone. Its other name is ADH. Aldosterone and vasopressin are two totally different hormones. They do two totally different things. What's vasopressin reabsorb? Water, what's aldosterone reabsorb? Salt. They work together, but they're two different hormones. And number four, vasopressin binds to the receptors in the distal tubule and collecting duct. That's the true one. Number four is the right answer. All right, so tubular segments that are permeable to bo the, the, yeah, you can read. <laughs> when you pull in a solute, you pull in comparable amounts of water. Where the solute goes, the water <coughs> flows, is what you'll hear over and over. So when you lose lots of water, we call the state, you're in a state of diuresis. There are two types of diuresis, though. So one's osmotic, which means the concentration of this extra fluid you're peeing out is the same or similar concentration to a normal urine sample. You're losing just as many solutes proportionally as you are water. What color is your urine going to be in osmotic diuresis, then? Is it going to be really watery and dilute, really, really concentrated and dark yellow, or the same as normal urine? Osmotic diuresis. Really, really clear, dilute, really, really concentrated, and dark yellow, or is it going to be the same as normal urine? It's same as normal urine. It's going to look like normal urine, you're just doing it a lot. And then water diuresis means that you're primarily losing water. Like if you're lacking ADH, what color is that going to be? Is it going to be dark yellow? Is it going to be normal? Or is it going to be very clear? It's very clear. Water diuresis is what you get when you've had a few drinks too many. See, there's your fun fact this week when someone goes, oh, man, broke the seal. You can get, actually, what happened is the alcohol affected your hypothalamus. You're not releasing a chemical called vasopressin ADH, which means that your kidneys can't retain water. So you're losing more water than you're, and by that time, they're already taking a leak in the bathroom. Right? <laughs> or on your leg, right. What, just me? 
So renal failure, when everything's starting to go haywire, there are a lot of different causes for renal failure, and the output's always the same. Bad. Okay, so renal failure is when both kidneys are so disrupted. Actually, it's when both kidneys have lost 70% of their function. Can you live with just one kidney? Yeah, if you have one kidney, that one kidney can do 80% of the, what two kidneys combined can do. So what it'll do, it'll actually become hypertrophic and it'll enlarge to do the work. So when both kidneys have over 70% loss, if you destroy a nephron, how long does it take to grow it back? It doesn't grow back, right? So once you've destroyed it, you destroyed it. All right, so some of the causes, infectious organisms, they can be from two routes. They can either be bloodborne or they can be from a UTI, something that came up through the urethra and the bladder and the ureters and all the way up. It's a little bit more challenging pathway, but it still happens. So infectious organisms, bacteria, viruses. And two toxic agents, things like, uh, well, some medications will do it. Aspirin can do it. Aspirin... Asthma really has a hard hit on the kidneys and the liver. Um, leads, lead goes to the kidney and causes problems. I'm trying to think of other ones. Usually metals, copper, lead, too much iron. Your kidney's trying to clear that stuff and it gets stuck in there and causes problems. Inappropriate immune response, there's a thing called glomerulonephritis. Oh, you know what? I was thinking about this yesterday in micro and I, it was a day ahead. But anyway, glomerulonephritis, what part of the kidney does it affect? Glomerulus. The glomerulus, and it causes what to happen? Nephritis. It causes inflammation of the whole nephron. So what happens is the glomerulus is like a spaghetti strainer. If your body starts making lots of antibodies, they're like little tiny proteins. Do they easily slip through the spaghetti strainer? They're little proteins. No. Do they slip through? No. It's like taking rice and putting it in a spaghetti strainer. What's the rice going to do? Start sticking in the holes and blocking it up. So when these antibodies stick in the holes and clog up the holes, it causes inflammation of the glomerulus, and eventually the glomerulus will blow out. Does it repair? Nope. The damage that's done is done. So inappropriate immune response. Lupus can do the same thing. Obstruction of urine flow. What could do that? Kidney stones, bladder stones, tumors, cancers, prostate inflammation, hi prostate hyperplasia, any of those different things. Every time I talk about the prostate, I, I, did I tell you about the pathophysiology in the prostate? I, just, I never forget that. I don't understand how that happens. I have no idea how somebody doesn't understand that. So, yeah. Why don't women get inflamed prostates? I, they asked about prostate cancer, but close enough. So anyway, insufficient renal blood flow. So if you have hypotension or anaphylactic shock or shock in general, it decreases blood flow to the kidney. The kidney needs 20 to 25% of the blood flow. And during shock, all your body's concerned about are two organs. What two organs is it worried about? The brain and the heart. So it redirects blood flow to the brain and the heart, depriving the blood flow from the kidney. And the kidney's used to high blood. So you starve the kidney and it dies. It's one of the first organs to go in multiple organ failure. Liver and kidney. All right, so now beyond the kidney, this, hold on, because now we have a whole other, the bladder, the ureters, and the urethra to talk about. So let's talk about micturition reflex, which means tinkle time. It's a tinkle reflex. If you understood defecation reflex, this is exactly the same. How many sphincters did you have for the defecation reflex? Two, an internal and an external. Which one, was smooth, which one was smooth muscle, the internal or the external? Internal. The internal. Which one was voluntarily controlled? External. The external because it was what kind of muscle? Skeletal. Skeletal. It's exactly the same. The pathway is the same. You get stretch of the bladder. So the bladder gets about three to five, three or, 300 or 500 milliliters of fluid in it, so about a half of a liter. It starts stretching. It sends a signal up to the spinal cord and stimulates what? The sympathetic or parasympathetic response? Which one's for rest and digest and peeing? The parasympathetic. And the parasympathetic relaxes which sphincter, internal or external? The internal. The external, as long as your spinal cord's intact, the external will actually get a signal from your cortex saying, now is not the place to wet yourself. So 
it sends a signal down and contracts that external urethral sphincter holding the urine in. People that get things like syphilis that affects the spinal cord and the pathway going up the spinal cord, people that have um, spinal trauma, they can't control the external urethral sphincter, so when they have to go, they just go, and that's called incontinence. There are actually lots of types of incontinence. There's stress incontinence, there's um, over, overflow incontinence where you just have too much urine in there and it overpowers the sphincters and still leaks out. Um, like overflow incontinence when you have to go and then if you're a woman and you start giggling and laughing, oops, it's a form of overflow incontinence. It's because the urethra on a woman is only a few centimeters long, where in a man it's about 18 centimeters long, so it's a huge difference. We've got a lot more muscle that can constrict. So when we go, we wet ourselves, they've got bigger problems if they're wetting themselves. All right, so the voluntary control comes from the cortex up here, sent all the way down and to the external urethral sphincter. So you can just see the pathways. Bladder fills, stretch receptors start getting triggered when this hits three to 500. So you can see it stretches, stretches, stretches. There's not a lot of pressure building until about 300 to 500. Then you see a, a huge climb in pressure. It's in this range that that reflex turns on. The stretch receptors send a signal to the parasympathetic. One signal goes up to the brain, and the brain's going, oh, oh, and it sends a signal down to stop the external urethral sphincter. But the parasympathetic starts squeezing the bladder. That's why you kind of feel like, you, uh, you have to move around a little bit. You're trying to put less pressure on the bladder. The bladder starts constricting. The internal urethral sphincter relaxes, and then tinkle happens, unless the external is still squeezed. That's it. Sure, you can go anytime you want. It's free country. But I'm going to start talking about fluid, acid, base, and electrolytes. All right, a lot of this is refresher. A lot of it is concepts you've seen. In fact, this whole section is about homeostasis. Balance. What comes in must go out. So it doesn't matter what you're talking about. If you're talking about water, salt, electrolytes, so potassium, sodium, chloride, whatever. If you're talking about temperature, if you're talking about acids and bases, whatever you're bringing in, you have to have the same output. What about calories? Do you have to have the same input and output? You should, right? If you're bringing lots of calories, but you're not putting them out by burning them, what happens to you? You get fat. If you're putting more out than you're bringing in, what happens to you? You get really, really skinny, right? So stable balance is what you shoot for in everything. Temperature, calories, sugar, salt, water, all of the electrolytes. A positive balance is when you have more input than output, and a negative balance is when you have more output than input. <coughs> Pretty simple terms. Stable balance is another way of saying what H word? Homeostasis. Right. So you basically have this internal pool of everything, whether it's proteins, fats, carbs, amino acids, all of those things. So you can make them metabolically, you can produce them like water we'll talk about. You make water in your body and then you have to put it out. What's a way that you get rid of water from your body? Urine, sweat, breathing. You breathe out water when you exhale. So we'll talk about water first. So water is about 60% of your body weight. If you were a fatter person, you have more fat on you, what happens to the percent of water in you? It goes up or goes down? It goes down, which means you're more susceptible to what happening to you than an average person. Dehydration, yep. Same thing with age. Just by getting older, you actually have less body water. So you're more susceptible to dehydration. So you have to remember these different compartments. Intracellular and extracellular. Intracellular is inside the cell. That's most of the water in the body. Extracellular is everything outside the cell. So the plasma, the extra, or interstitial space, synovial fluids, vitreous humors, aqueous humors, all of the fluids in the body that are not inside of cells. Those are all extracellular. But most of these are all like insignificant. Lymphatics or lymph, insignificant. The plasma and the interstitial fluid are where most of the fluids are at extracellularly. So of all these different compartments, which ones do you have direct control over? Which do you have direct control over? Intracellular, plasma, or interstitial? You as a medical professional, you have direct control over the plasma which is the least of those different departments. If you were doing intracellular, you'd have to give about 100 trillion injections into one person to get every single cell. 
Interstitial fluid, technically, I guess you could have direct control over it. Um, like when my rats in the lab would get dehydrated, they wouldn't drink any water. We'd actually just pick them up. We'd take a syringe full of water and inject it between their shoulder blades. And they look like a hunchback with this big bolus of water back there. But why did we do that? Because we couldn't open their mouth and pour the water down, right? Rats resist that and they bite and they get angry. I tried. I'm kidding. <laughs> but by putting it there, where does the water start moving? It moves to two places. If you put it in the interstitial fluid, it moves in two directions. Because it's too much water in the interstitial fluid, it doesn't want to stay there. Where does it go? Part of it will go to the lower water concentration plasma, and the other part goes to the lower water concentration in the cells. So it divides and goes its two separate ways. There's a barrier that separates these different compartments. You have the cell membrane, the plasma membrane, which remember is impermeable to water. So you can actually keep the extracellular fluid at different concentrations than the intracellular fluid because of that plasma membrane. And then the blood vessel separates the two extracellular fluids, the plasma and the interstitial space. Is that permeable to water, blood vessels? Remember, blood vessels are kind of like my fingers overlapping. Is there, can water move through that? Yeah, see the little pores? So water can move back and forth. The fluid in the blood and the fluid in the interstitial sp sp space, their concentrations are identical. It's like this. I keep seeing this every semester and I can't fix it. I don't know what the hell happened there. All those flip backwards. Of the whole picture, why only that part did it, I don't know. It's a cool trick. But when you look at the extracellular fluids, the plasma and interstitial fluid, look, they're identical. The only thing that really makes them different is a what? Can proteins easily slip across the, the uh, blood vessel membrane? No. The proteins stay in the blood. They don't slip across the blood. You already knew that. That's the only thing that's different. So your amount of HCO3 negative, which is what? What's the word? Bicarbonate. Yep. Bicarbonate, chloride, sodium, potassium, all these are the same concentrations. The water is the same concentration, roughly. But when you look at the plasma membrane that separates the cells from the extracellular fluid, look at what dr dramatically changes. What happens to their bicarbonate levels? Whew. Goes down to practically nothing. It slides into the other. What about their sodium levels? Practically nothing. Did you already know this? The island cell, remember? High in potassium, banana trees. This is phosphate. So it's high in potassium. Around it, surrounded by salt water, NaCl water. So you already knew that. It's the plasma membrane and the blood vessels that separate those compartments. All right, so fluid balance is maintained by extracellular volume and extracellular fluid osmolarity, the concentrations. If you have a more hypertonic extracellular fluid, what's going to happen to your cells as a, re a result? Hypertonic solution does what to cells? Makes them look like raisins. It pulls the water out of them. It finds those little aquaporins and sucks the water out. And then when we talk about osmolarity, you have to remember its concentration. When we talk about volume, it's the amount of water. You can increase the volume and not change the osmolarity at all, or vice versa. You can change the osmolarity and not change the volume at all. Osmolarity is when you change the like proportion or the concentration of water to solute. Volume is just the amount. About how much volume do you have in your blood? If you're a male, it's about five and a half liters, and if you're a female, it's about five. The osmolarity, about how, what percent of salt do you have in your blood? Whether you're a man or a woman, that number is exactly the same. It should be about 0.9%. Yeah, so about less than 1% sodium. Saline solutions, 0.9% saline solution. All right, so the osmolarity, whether you're a man or a woman, it should be the same. The volume is a different, diff totally different thing, so don't get them confused. And I already explained this. So volume, you can directly affect that by sticking an IV in them and pushing fluids into them. You directly regulate the plasma volume. You indirectly regulate the interstitial fluid. As you put stuff in the plasma, it will slowly move to the interstitial fluid. If I injected that rat in their interstitial fluid, it slowly moves to the plasma. I directly affect one and it indirectly affects the other. Controlling the extracellular fluid is super important for long-term regulation of blood pressure. Not immediate, but long-term. So your body is constantly regulating. It's looking at the salt balance. Do you remember where we, I, we just mentioned osmoreceptors are at that detect salt and water concentrations? 
I'll give you a hint. It's an organ that releases a hormone that regulates. If I tell you the thing it regulates, I give it away. An organ has osmo receptors, releases a hormone based on those osmo receptors to help you retain something in the kidney. What were the two hormones we've already talked about today? Aldosterone and ADH. Which one has a structure in it that has an osmo receptor? And when you screw up the osmo receptor, you don't regulate your volume very well. The hypothalamus. That's the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is constantly monitoring, maintaining this osmolarity. What's the name of the hormone that it releases? ADH. Okay. So short term, the short term is just a quick fix. So if your blood pressure starts dropping really quick, you already know one system in your body is going to try and change that. Your blood pressure starts dropping, what structure in your body goes, oh crap, medulla oblongata. So you know the central nervous system is going to start controlling it. So your baroreceptor reflex, where are the two baroreceptor sets? Carotid and the aortic arch, yep. So that receptor sends a signal to the medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata for low pressure does what? What's it do to the sympathetic nervous system if you have low blood pressure? Turns it up, right? It's trying to raise the blood pressure. It constricts blood vessels, decreases flow to the kidney, which makes you retain more water. Does what to the heart? Makes the heart beat faster and harder. Can it control the parasympathetic? This is a big picture slide. You have to think back. Is there any influence on the parasympathetic by the medulla when your blood pressure changes? Yes. Does it affect blood vessels? No. What's it affect? Your parasympathetic does what to, your, to help your blood pressure? What organ is it controlling? Let's take a step back. Sympathetic controlled two things, blood vessels and the heart. Made the blood vessels constrict, made the heart squeeze harder and faster. What can the parasympathetic do? Blood vessels? No, it can only affect the heart when it comes to blood pressure. So what's it do to the heart? If your blood pressure is low, will the parasympathetic turn up or turn down? It turns down. It wants you to start beating your heart harder. If your brain were out of the picture, your heart beats harder and faster than it normally does while your brain's in. So if you decapitate yourself for some reason, your heart would go faster. It would be faster and harder. Your brain's saying, man, slow down. We've got like 80 years left. You don't need to burn it all up now. If you have high blood pressure, what happens to the sympathetic? It turns down. What happens to the parasympathetic? It turns up. And don't forget, I'm just making it simple. You have to remember what the sympathetic controls and what the parasympathetic controls. They're not the same thing. So short-term fix. You're running for your life. You have a drop in blood pressure. You have a spike in blood pressure. Any of those things, immediate change in your blood volume and your blood pressure. And then the second one, temporary automatic, or sorry, Temporary automatic fluid shift between compartments. Think about this. If my blood, if I'm decreasing blood volume and my blood pressure is going down, where can the blood immediately get water from? Interstitial fluid. It borrows it from the interstitial fluid. It starts pulling it from the interstitial fluid in. If you have high volume in the interstitial fluid, low volume in the blood, what, does, what did FIT tell you about differences? It, everything will move high to low. Yeah. So if you have low blood volume, you're going to rapidly move the water from the interstitial fluid into the blood. So a decreased blood volume, you shift it from interstitial fluid into the blood. Can the interstitial fluid get water from anywhere? The cells. And then it'll start pulling water from the cell into the interstitial fluid. And it'll just keep draining downhill. It's like having these very watery cells to the less watery interstitial fluid to the very little water blood. It keeps moving downstream and then increase plasma volume, you have too much water there, it goes the exact opposite. It starts moving into the interstitial fluid and then into the cells. Can you actually get too much water in your body? Yes, you can. If your cells start swelling, all the machinery in the cells like the machinery in a clock. What happens if you take one gear and move it in a clock? The whole clock stops. It can't do it. All the machinery in a cell is exactly like that. If you make a cell expand too much, and all those gears start moving apart, all the machinery starts moving apart, the cell will die. You'll actually kill the cell. So yeah, you can get too much water. Hard to do, but you can do it. All right, so if a patient has a spontaneous drop in blood pressure, what would be the physiological short-term response? 
What's a physiological short-term response? Argue with your neighbor and tell them why they're wrong. Tell them why you're right, I guess is a better way to word that. How about number one? If you have high blood pressure, or sorry, drop in blood pressure. If you have low blood pressure, would you activate the parasympathetic nervous system? What would parasympathetic want to do to your heart? Slow it down. What's going to happen to your blood pressure? Drop even more. What are you falling into if that happens? Shock. You don't want that to happen. So number one and two have to be wrong since they're both activating parasympathetic. How about number three or number four? So we know it's activating the sympathetic. What's the other thing that happens? So activation of sympathetic nervous system and move fluid out of the cell or move fluid into the cells? If your blood volume and pressure is dropping, do you want to move fluid out of the cells or into the cells? You want to pull it out of the cells and put it into the blood to bring the blood volume back up. So what was that, number three or four? That was number three. Everybody understand why? If your blood volume is low, you're going to pull fluid from the interstitial fluid and you're going to pull it from the cells to try and bring your blood volume back up so you have a raise in blood pressure. You raise the volume, you raise the pressure. All right. The long-term regulator falls in the hands of the kidneys. So the kidneys are going to help regulate long-term. The kidneys can't work as fast as the sympathetic nervous system. They take time because you're making this urine, you're slowly pushing this pre-urine through the tubules. It takes time to adjust it. It's not a fast response. And then the other mechanisms, the thir thirst mechanism, where's that at? That's in the central nervous system. Where? Hypothalamus. Yep. So hypothalamus making you drink. When you drink water, does it instantly go into you? Nope, it goes to your stomach, starts moving from the stomach to the small intestine, small intestine to the interstitial fluid to the blood, and then finally it brings your blood volume up. It takes a little time. So you do this by regulating your urine output and your fluid intake. If you're low blood volume, what are you going to raise? Urine output or fluid intake? Yep, you're going to raise the fluid intake and do what to urine output? Lower it. Try and retain more water. Right? And then salt's kind of the key to this whole thing. So regulating salt helps regulate everything else. We already knew this. If you bring in salt, you bring in sugar, you bring in amino acids. If you push out salt, you bring in potassium. If you bring in salt to your body, you bring in what wants to chase the salt, it wants to chase every solute? Water. So watch the salt. Where the salt's going determines where everything else is moving. So maintenance of salt is primary importance in maintaining blood volume. You bring in more salt, you bring in more water, you do what to blood volume? Increase it. What do you do to blood pressure? Increase it. And then maintenance of water is primary in osmolarity. So volume is salt, osmolarity is water. If you eat a bag of salty pretzels, what's going to happen to your urine output? It's going to decrease. It's going to become more concentrated. Guess what's going to increase in your urine? Salt. You're pushing the salt out. What are you going to start retaining more of? The water. Yeah. All right, so salt input and ingestion, or is ingestion, and salt output, sweat, feces, Urination. Sweat and urine are pretty much the same thing. If you didn't know. They have urea, they have sodium, potassium, chloride. There are actually some vitamins that are in both of them, like vitamin C. So the next time you're at the gym and you're sweating like crazy and you're rubbing that all over your face, just think about what you're rubbing on your face. Avoid the gym. Ugh. <laughs> All right, the kidney is adjusted to the amount of salt that created by two processes, the GFR. If you want to retain more salt, what would you do to your GFR? Would you increase the filtration rate or decrease the filtration rate? If you want to retain more salt, you decrease it. If you decrease the filtration rate, what do you do to the speed of the fluid moving through the kidney? You slow it, giving you more time to do what to chemicals you want? Reabsorb. The slower the fluid moves through the kidneys, the more you reabsorb. 
Same with water. The slower it moves through, the more water you reabsorb, which makes your urine more concentrated. And then tubular reabsorption of sodium in the distal and the collecting tubules is based on renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. What regulates the blockage of sodium reabsorption at the same place? What was the name of the hormone that blocks sodium reabsorption? Starts with an A, you're right. Atrial natriuretic peptide, A and P. So tubule reabsorption of sodium in the distal and collecting tubules because of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, blocking tubular reabsorption because of A and P. And then you've seen this before. You know the process. You filter, and then you start reabsorbing based on this. So don't forget this slide. All the functions that happen. Where's renin released from? Kidney. Where's angiotensin released from? Sorry, an angiotensin ogen. Where's it released from? Ooh. You just missed that test question. The liver. Where is, where's angiotensin 1 turned into angiotensin 2? The lungs by what enzyme? ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme. All right, so you can look. If you have a drop in so sodium in the body, your blood pressure is going to drop, and then your GFR is going down. If your GFR is going down, what happens to the speed of flow through the kidney? If you have slow filtration, what happens to the speed that the fluid moves through the kidney? Think about a garden hose. If I slow down the nozzle, what happens to the speed of the water going through? It slows down. If I slow down the pressure of blood going into the kidney, the filtration will actually slow down. If I'm filtering less, what's it give me a chance to do more? Reabsorb. So I start reabsorbing more sodium, excreting less sodium, and then what happens to, what chases the sodium? The water. So I start saving the sodium, I start saving the water, I increase the sodium load in my body, increase my volume and my blood pressure. Osmolarity, remember you're looking at water concentration compared to solutes in general. Again, this is all repeated stuff that you've seen before. Right. So usually the osmolarity of the intracellular and the extracellular is the same. Are the ions the same? Are the concentrations of the ions the same inside the cell versus outside the cell? No. You have different concentrations, but the osmolarity overall, the concentration of water compared to ions in general, is the same. That way it keeps the flow in and the flow out about the same. If you start screwing with one, you start adding salt to the blood, what's that do to the ion concentration in the blood? Makes it hypo or hypertonic? Hypertonic, where's the water want to start going? Into the cell or into the blood? Into the blood, what's going to happen to the cell? shrivels up. That's why the concentrations have to stay the same or the osmolarity has to stay the same. And you already know this too, primarily in the extracellular fluid, what ions are out there? Sodium and chloride. Yep. And in the intracellular fluid, you look at potassium. And then the proteins are in the inter intracellular also. They're helping to pull water in. Right. So you already know these terms. Hypertonicity means a raise in what? Solvent or solute? Hypertonicity is a raise in Solute and a drop in solvent, which is water. Hypotonicity means a drop in solute and a raise in solvent. They always work like that. If you look at one liter of blood and it's hypertonic, it always means there are more solutes and less solvents in that blood. If you look at the same liter and it's hypotonic, that just means there's less solute and more solvent. It's still the same volume. It's the tonicity you're changing. Right? And isotonic means it's the same as everywhere else in the body. Yeah. So you already know this. Hypertonicity is associated with dehydration or negative water balance. You're losing water, which means the sol solutes are becoming more abundant in your blood. So hypertonicity is when you're losing lots of water. It's associated with dehydration. Or you're taking in way too many solutes, like salt. 
can cause hypertonicity. How do you feel when you eat a bag of pretzels? For like the next half hour, you feel like drinking lots and lots of water. You feel dehydrated. Right? And then it causes insufficient water intake, excessive water loss, or here's a disease you have to know, diabetes insipidus. It is not the same as diabetes mellitus. The only thing they have in common is they both cause polyuria. What's that? Excessive urine, not sugar. That's actually the thing that makes them different. Which one would have sugar in the urine? Mellitus. Insipidus has nothing to do with sugar at all. Diabetes insipidus revolves around ADH. When you have diabetes insipidus, you're peeing a lot. What's going on? Are you making too much ADH or too little ADH? Think of Friday night. Why are you peeing so much? Because you have too little ADH. When you're making too little ADH, you pee lots and lots and lots, which is called diabetes insipidus. And then the results, because of dehydration and the hypertonic or hypertonic situation, your cells start shrinking like a raisin. Hypotonic, just the opposite. Drinking way too much fluid and not urinating enough, retaining excess fluid, and they call it water intoxication. And now I forgot the woman's name. I think her last name was Strange. Some unique last name, but the woman that it was a uh, don't wee wee for a wee or something was the contest where you you couldn't you couldn't go to the bathroom. You had to be the last person to evacuate your bladder. And she actually overhydrated because they kept giving them, them fluids to drink and they couldn't go pee, so she overhydrated. Her body became hypotonic. Her cells started expanding. She started complaining about headaches and pain in her head. What was happening? She was getting intracranial pressure and increasing her intracranial pressure. Her cells were swelling all over her body. Is there a lot of room for your brain to swell? No. And then she died. All right. So causes over drinking, not over drinking alcohol, over drinking fluids in general, like water. Kidney failure where you can't get rid of the water. The kidneys aren't clearing. Or having too much ADH. This is interesting. And you have when you have too much ADH, it's called S I A D H. That's the name of the disorder. Syndrome of inappropriate ADH. I, they just couldn't come up with a better one, I guess. But it doesn't tell you the direction. Inappropriate ADH just means they have too much ADH. If you have too much of an antidiuretic hormone, you retain way too much water. If you don't have enough antidiuretic, you lose too much water. So the cells swell. It, this doesn't happen very much because we use our kidneys. It's when the kidneys aren't working or you're not allowing the kidneys to work that you have this problem. And then isotonic fluid loss or gain. There's no shift between the different compartments. How could you lose fluid? But it's isotonic. What could be happening to you that you're losing lots of fluid, but it's an isotonic fluid? You're losing solutes and solvents equally. Well, I could cut your femoral artery and you bleed out, right? That's an isotonic fluid loss. You're losing exactly the same number of solutes as fluids, and of course that's where my brain goes first. What's another way you could lose a lot of fluids? And unfortunately too many people try and replace these fluids by drinking pure water. Good idea? No. What are they doing? Excessive sweating. Like when they run marathons out in the hot sun and they're sweating a lot, you're losing sodium, potassium, chloride, electrolytes, vitamins, lots of different minerals. You're losing water and then they drink straight water. What are they actually doing to their body by replacing the isotonic loss with pure water, are they going into a state of hyper or hypertonicity, or hyper or hypotonicity? Hypo, they're over bringing pure water in, they're diluting their blood. Not a good idea. That's why you should drink Gatorade like substances. All right, what's associated with water intoxication? Iso, hyper, hypo, or electrotonic? <laughs> I always have to have a number four, so it's just something to put there. So water intoxication would be hype. Oh, yeah. What would hypertonic be associated with? Dehydration. 
and isotonic things like sweating excessively or bleeding. Um, burns are another situation with isotonic. A lot of fluid loss, you have to worry about them getting dehydrated. All right, so control of water balance by means of vasopressin and thirst reflex by what organ re controls both of those? Vasopressin and thirst, hypothalamus. Yep. Every day you bring in about 2,600 milliliters of water. That's your drinking. You drink about two and a half, well, two and a quarter, what am I thinking? Two liter bottles. That's one two liter bottle and then a quarter of another one you bring in in a day. And it's not just by drinking fluids. That's by eating food too, which if people are trying to lose weight, what's one of the first things they tell them to do? Drink more water because your body, you don't, you're not always in tune. Your body's saying, we need more water. So you go to the refrigerator, you open it up and you stare. Hmm. And then you eat something. Did that make you happy, by the way? It never does. If you walk to the refrigerator and you're just staring, looking for anything, and you don't know what it is, just turn around and get a drink out of the faucet because it's your body's way of saying, drink something. But instead, you eat something from the, from the um, refrigerator, and then you sit down, and you're like, hmm, I need something else. And you go back, and you eat some more, and you eat some more, until finally you get a drink of something, and then you're fine. All right, so about... 1.25 liters a day you bring in, so a little over a liter. A thousand milliliters, so about one liter through your food, and 350 milliliters by metabolic production, metabolism. When we looked at that equation before, when you had things like um, carbonic acid and bicarbonate and acid on one side, and then you had the water and the CO2 on the other side, that's a metabolic reaction. Taking acids and bicarbonate and shifting it over to make water and CO2. How do you get rid of both of those? How can you get rid of both of those? Right? You just breathe out water and CO2. So insensible loss would be, um, well, breathing is a perfect example of insensible loss. And then sweating, feces, and urine. So kind of the gimmies. And obviously, you're going to breathe 24 hours a day, hoping, and you're constantly losing that. You can't control this. Right, control of water in the urine by vasopressin. It's made in the hypothalamus. You knew that. It's stored in the posterior pituitary. It's the second time today you've seen that. And its whole purpose is to what? Regulate salt or water. Vasopressin regulates specifically water. What regulates the salt? Aldosterone or... Aldosterone makes you reabsorb the salt. What makes you get rid of the salt? Or block reabsorption is the best way to say it. The other one, right. <laughs> Atrial natriuretic peptide. So remember, ADH and vasopressin is directly working on water, not salt. Vasopressin directly works on what structures in your body? What's the name telling you? So ADH, when you look at it as ADH, you should think the kidney. What are you thinking with vaso? Vessels. It's directly squeezing the blood vessels, right? And then the thirst response, also the hypothalamus. And then regulations by those osmoreceptors. So the hypothalamus has little receptors that detect water to solute concentration. If you have way too much solute, what's it going to make you want to do? Pee more by releasing vasopressin, or sorry, by blocking vasopressin, or is it going to make you drink more water? If you have too much solute, what do you want to have more of? Solvent, which is what? Water, what's it going to do? Is it going to make you drink less or drink more? Makes you drink. You want water, right? Are you going to drink less or drink more? You drink more. What's it going to do to ADH? What will the hypothalamus do to ADH if you have too much solute? Will it release more ADH or stop releasing ADH? If you stop releasing ADH, what happens to you? We talked about this on Friday night. You pee more. Do you want to lose more water? No, so you start releasing more ADH. You drink more water and you release ADH to pull more water in. This was supposed to be a question, but the word already popped up. So if you stimulate vasopressin secretion and thirst mechanisms, the osmolarity is high. Too much solute. You're trying to bring more water in and retain more water. And then to a lesser extent, the left atrial volume receptors release what hormone? Left atrial volume receptors release what hormone? A and P, atrial natriuretic peptide and then angiotensin to the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. These are all water regulators. So there's a flow chart in your book that looks like this. You can follow it right through. So if your blood volume drops, your blood pressure drops, 
the left atrial volume receptors freak out, they stop releasing A and P, they send a signal up to the hypothalamus until the hypothalamus releases vasopressin, start drinking water, you bring water in, you retain more water, your volume goes up, all is better in the world. Next is acid base. Oh my. Mm, kind of moving right along. So acids and bases. First thing we we'll know about acids, when we talk about acid, it's any chemical that liberates or freeze is another word for liberate, right? We just had Veterans Day, so when you think of liberty and freedom, it's the same thing. When you liberate a hydrogen ion, you free it from whatever it was stuck to. If it was HCl, what was it stuck to? Chloride. Yeah, there's no ion, there's no plus at the top of it when it's stuck to something else. As soon as you free it up, it has that plus. I always anamorph everything. So in my mind, when I was trying to learn acids and bases, I always imagined hydrogen, the smallest element on the periodic table, has one electron. That's the only thing it has is that one little electron floating around. I always think of it like a, a kid with a teddy bear. The one thing it has in this world is a teddy bear. When you remove that electron, you just stole the teddy bear from this hydrogen. How is it going to feel? Pissed off, right? Now it's angry. This hydrogen's missing its electron. What's it going to do? If somebody stole your teddy bear, what are you going to do? You're going to find somebody else's teddy bear and steal it right back, right? So it's angry. When you see this free, liberated hydrogen, it's not a good situation. It's dangerous. When you see a whole army of this hydrogen, so the more hydrogens you have, what kind of situation are you looking at? A more delicate, calm situation or a very violent situation? Violent. The more free or liberated hydrogens you have, the more destructive the stuff is. We refer to it as being more acidic. A base binds the hydrogen. A base has an extra electron. So usually over a base, you'll see a negative charge. When you bring this positive, the negative means it has an extra electron. You bring this hydrogen close to this extra electron, it's like the base is saying, I have two teddy bears you want to share. And it shares with it. So what's a base do to that acid's anger? It neutralizes it. Yeah, it makes the acid calm, docile. So when you introduce an acid to a base in equal proportions, it neutralizes them, keeps them neutral. So bases bind the acids. Acids free up the hydrogens. So here's an example. Hydrochloric acid. Where do you see this? This would be an example of your stomach acids, right? Hydrochloric. This is an extremely volatile or very reactive acid. It's a strong acid. When you put it in water, it liberates the hydrogens. Every drop of this frees up the hydrogen. So now I have all these hydrogen particles that are what? Angry or happy? They're angry. The more this hydrochloric acid, the more I have in the solution, the more dangerous it becomes. You can take something that's an acid that's like this that has a hydrogen on it that's not so dangerous. Like bicarbonate, bi or sorry, carbonic acid. I slipped. There's carbonic acid. It has extra hydrogens. But when you put it in water, one of the hydrogens kind of breaks free and it moves away without its teddy bear. How's this one feel? Angry. But most of them don't do that. So this is a weaker acid. It doesn't liberate very well. In fact, this is acid, free acid. What is this stuff? I slipped already and said. Yeah, it's bicarbonate. So it's slightly basic. They're just on the other sides. And what will happen is when these two get together, they'll bind up and another one will free up. And they just keep trading off. Who's going to be the angry one without the teddy bear? When you look at pH, pH is referring to how acidic or basic something is. Acids and bases go hand in hand. If you have a very acidic environment, you can also say it's a very not basic. If you have a very basic environment, you can say it's not very acidic. They're like a teeter-totter. You can't just remove half of the teeter-totter. It's when you start shifting the weight to one side, you become more of one and less of the other. So when you look at the scale, it goes from 0 to 14. The closer to 14, the more basic it is. The closer to 0, the more acidic it is. So 7 is perfectly down the middle, which means you have exactly the same number of bases as acids, which means what do you know about the solution? It's perfectly neutral. Everything's happy. Water, pure water, is perfectly neutral. You have an OH negative, which is a base, and you have an H plus, which is an acid. You bring them together, tink, they form H2O, which is water. Human blood is slightly what compared to water? Acidic or basic? Slightly basic. It's about 7.4. That's a number you'll want to remember forever. Human blood should be about 
it actually ranges from 7.35 to 7.45 depending on what <laughs> vessels you're in but it moves back and forth so saliva is slightly acidic rainwater like acid rain is going to be acidic coffee acidic look at the stomach way down here at a pH just below 2 very very acidic soda should be right around here somewhere too where's soda it, unless, there it is yeah it's 3 and then why would milk of magnesia be way up here on this end? What is this telling you? It's very basic. Why would you drink milk of magnesia then? Where are you putting it? What are you trying to do? Heartburns is the problem you're trying to solve. But what's causing that problem? Too much stomach acid. You're trying to neutralize it. That's why it's thick. It goes down and lines your stomach lining to neutralize the acids to ease your stomach. Oven cleaner, extremely corrosive. Uh, I used to rebuild Volkswagens when I was a teenager, and I would spray the underside of old Volkswagen Beetles with oven cleaner, and it would peel all the underlying, all the under whatever coating off of it. And I never could figure out why my hands always were like red and irritated. Why? Because I was young, stupid, and I got it on my hands. What was it doing to my hands? It was eating my hands. It's just like putting acid on your hands. It starts eating away at it. It made it all slimy and nasty. Okay, so blood pH is 7.4. It actually varies a little bit. When this is in the book and they refer to arterial blood, they mean systemic arteries. This is why. What do you have more of in systemic veins than you have in systemic arteries? What's more in a systemic vein? CO2. And at the very first day of class, I told you forever, you always want to associate CO2 with what other chemical in your body? Acid. <laughs> CO2 goes up, what happens to acid? Goes up. CO2 goes down, acid goes down. You breathe heavy, <laughs> you're blowing out CO2, what are you also losing? Acids. The acids in your body goes down. I told you the first day and the example I gave you was blowing up a balloon. You blow up a balloon, <sighs> you're losing lots of CO2, what's happening to your blood as a result? You're becoming too alkaline, too basic. So where you see more CO2, you're going to see a more what? A more acidic or a more basic environment? More CO2 means it's going to be slightly more acidic compared to other areas. All right, acidosis is mean, means you're below 7.4, technically below 7.35. Alkalosis means you're above 7.4, or technically above 7.45. Right. Death occurs if you hit 6.8 or 8.0. So it doesn't seem like there's much of a range there. It's not like your stomach, your stomach's way, way, way down here at 2.0. Right. There's not a lot of variability. Because if your blood becomes too acidic or too basic, your, your red blood cells can't carry oxygen appropriately and then you die. Also proteins. If you take a, an egg and you crack it open and put it in acid, it denatures. It turns what color? What color is the clear part of the egg turn? White. Does it change back? Nope. Enzymes, proteins, if you put them in an acidic or a, in a basic environment, they change their shape and they don't work the same. It's the same thing with hemoglobin. You change its pH, it changes its shape, and it doesn't work the same. All right, so ideally 7.4. So fluctuation in the hydro hydrogen ions, which is H+, have huge effects on the body like this. Excitability of nerve and muscle cells. If your blood becomes too alkaline, your neurons start firing excessively. If your blood becomes too basic, or sorry, too acidic, they slow down their firing. Think of diabetic ketone acidosis. Are they over anxious? Are they excited? Are they really pumped up? It's ketone acidosis. How are they acting? Their brain starts slowing down. They look like they're drunk. They think slowly. They respond slowly. And if it becomes too acidic, where do they actually slip into? A coma, where their brain is not working very well at all. And then eventually, they slip into dead. So excitability of nerve and muscle tissues. The acidic environment causes things to slow down. The basic environment speeds them up. Number two, influence on enzymes. I already told you it changes the shape of enzymes. Things like hemoglobin, super important enzyme. Albumins, which carry hormones, super important proteins. And number three, influence on potassium levels. This is also important in diabetics. Because as you increase acid in your blood, you actually decrease potassium in your blood. Can that be dangerous? What organ are you worrying about with low potassium or high potassium? The heart. The heart. You have to worry about your heart. 
it's really tricky because you've seen you've heard of sodium potassium pumps, but they're actually sodium or sorry sodium hydrogen potassium pumps too. Whereas it moves hydrogen one way, it moves potassium another. So as your blood levels of acid start going up, your blood levels of potassium start dropping, and vice versa. All right. Have you seen this equation before? No. You sure have. We've talked about it, I think, three times now. We talked about it in the lungs. We talked about it in the blood. Maybe we've talked about it somewhere else. But I told you to have to know it. Here's your CO2, H2O, carbonic and hydrase, the enzyme, turns it into carbonic acid. And then the carbonic acid frees up the hydrogen and frees up bicarbonates. This is a weak acid. This is a strong, powerful acid. So CO2, as I raise the CO2, what do I have to do to this side? Raise it also. Remember the bathtub example I told you? As you dump something in this side, it shifts over, makes this, and makes this. The level stays the same across. As you drain this side, what happens to this side over here? It also drains or lowers. If you pull the plug in the bathtub on this side, and you start blowing CO2 out, it starts pulling the whole equation over here to the left and draining the acids too. That's why I said, anytime you see a raise in CO2, you have to see a raise in acid. Anytime you see a lowering of CO2, you see a lowering of acid. It's just that direct relationship. All right, so sources, carbonic and, oh, sorry, carbonic acid formation. So when you're doing things like breathing, transporting, what are you transporting when you're making bicarbonate? You're transporting CO2. Remember, oxygen is carried on hemoglobin, but most of the CO2 is carried as bicarbonate. And then inorganic acids made during the breakdown of nutrients, like proteins we talked about in the lab last week. So when you're breaking down proteins, you're making acid, acidic com compounds, like uric acid. And then three organic acids from intermediary metabolism, like ketone bodies. When your body's metabolizing protein, it makes ketone bodies, which are also known as ketone acids, right? Three line of defense, you have to know all three of these, and they're actually rated by speed here. The fastest one's the chemical buffer. As soon as you make an acid, the chemical buffers in the cells or around the cells try and neutralize it immediately. They buffer it. Buffer means to neutralize or keep it the same pH, technically. So if the system becomes too acidic, it can buffer it. If it becomes too basic, it can buffer it. It's trying to keep the pH the same. They work within seconds, milliseconds, actually. Respiratory takes a little bit longer, minutes to potentially hours. If somebody becomes more acidic, what would you expect them to start doing? If their blood's becoming more acidic, what would you expect them to start doing based on this equation? Your blood's becoming more acidic. Would you start breathing heavier or lighter? Why heavier? Because you're trying to blow out the CO2, and as, as you're blowing out the CO2, you're also losing the acids, bringing you back more to a neutral. So when somebody starts going into ketone acidosis, what's one of the physical symptoms you're going to see if they're going through an acid state of acidosis? They're like breathing like they just walked up the steps. They look sleepy, they look tired, they look like they're short of breath. So going and then number three, renal mechanisms. So this takes usually hours to kick in. The kidney doesn't work nearly as fast as the lungs. But if you eat lots and lots of proteins, later that day, what's going to happen to your urine? It's become, going to become very acidic. Yeah. The Atkins diet. You're taking too many proteins, you're making all those ketone acids. The kidney's going to have to try and get rid of those. So the first buffer is the chemical buffer, and you have to know all four. There are four of them. You want to know what they buffer and where they do it. So carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer works in the extracellular fluid for non-carbonic acids. It's called the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer because those are the chemicals that do the buffering. That's not what they're buffering. They don't buffer carbonic acids. Number two is the protein buffer, and this is intracellularly. Where is it telling you it's at? Inside every cell in your body. It's the protein buffer system. Proteins are made of amino acids. They're a long chain. One side has an amine, which is a base. The other side has a carbo or carboxylic acid, which is an acid. So if you have too many aminos or bases, they can actually stick to the acid side. If you have too many acids, they can stick to the base side. 
this protein is actually buffering or neutralizing the excessive, excessive acids or bases in your body, in the cells specifically. The third one is the hemoglobin buffer system, and this buffers carbonic acid. So which one doesn't buffer carbonic acid? Number one that says specifically for non-carbonic acids. If you have a carbonic acid that's generated from this pathway here, it's buffered by the hemoglobin buffer system. Remember, these acids go into the red blood cell, and then the hemoglobin grabs it and binds it. So this is happening inside the red blood cells. And the last one is the phosphate buffer system, and this is happening in the tubules of the kidneys. So it's a urinary buffer. So four chemical buffers that happen within seconds. Wherever this acid is being produced or this base is being produced, these mechanisms work in that spot. So it works <clears throat> excuse me, in the blood. Here you have intracellularly. Here you have in the blood cell. And here you have in the tubules of the kidney. And here's how some of these work, like that phosphate buffer. So phosphate's kind of interesting because phosphate is actually slightly basic. But you're losing it in situations when you're too acidic. So you take and you pull in the CO2, you put it through this chemical reaction and make acid. You put the acid in the tubule and the acid sticks to the phosphate and gets cleared from your system. It's almost like it's on a kamikaze mission. It's a suicide run here where the phosphate's leaving because it's binding to an acid and leaving your body. So this base binds to an acid to help neutralize your, your body and the tubules of the kidney. So if I asked you a question on a test like this, hydrogen ions are made from carbonic acid or buffered by what? Hydrogen ions made from carbonic acid are buffered by what? Three minutes left. Keep the brain clicking away. The more we finish here, the less time we spend in the lab, by the way. So hydrogen ions made from carbonic acid are buffered by what? Are they buffered by the bicarbonate system? The carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer? Absolutely not. Remember the first thing I told you is non-carbonic acids. This is saying it is specifically carbonic acid, so what's it bind to? Look at your notes. It binds to the hemoglobin buffer. Number two is the right answer. Remember this is binding in the tubules. This is binding inside of cells. This is in the blood cells to bind carbonic acids and then bicarbonates in the blood. Respiratory, a little bit slower than the chemicals, but you want to remember it's trying to lose CO2 because what's chasing the CO2? The acid. You lose the CO2 on this end through the lung. So every time you see this equation, I always think lung here, kidney here. The primary regulator of CO2 in the body is the lung. Primary regulator of this side, the bicarbonate in the body, is the kidney. Kidney can directly lose acid, kidney can directly lose base. The lungs don't directly lose those. The lungs lose car carbon dioxide and water, which pulls the equation this way. So if you have too much acid in the body, we already talked about this, you start breathing heavier to blow out the CO2, which shifts this equation over, reducing your acids. And the last one is the renal. Like I said it can take hours to days to work. And in this, you can pump the hydrogens directly out. You can make new bicarbonate and bring it in, but you absolutely cannot reabsorb hydrogen. You can't reabsorb the hydrogen. Once you push the hydrogen into the tubule, it's committed to leaving. So you filter hydrogen, it's committed to leaving. You pump out hydrogen in the distal tubule, it's committed to leaving. Once you push out the acid, it's committed to leaving. You can never pull the acid back in. So if your body is too acidic, what's your kidney going to do? Is it going to reabsorb acids or secrete acids? Secretes them. If your body is too basic, can your kidney reabsorb acids? No. But it can secrete a base. What's that base? What's the base we keep talking about over and over and over again? Bicarbonate. Yeah. So it's going to secrete and excrete bicarbonate. So it does regulation of acids and bases by secreting hydrogens or secreting or reabsorbing bicarbonate. It's kind of the key there. Bicarbonate can go both ways, but hydrogen can only go one direction. And here's just an example of it. So here you have that pump. There's that potassium hydrogen pump I was telling you about before. 
So as you're pumping out the hydrogen, you're actually pulling potassiums in. You can push the hydrogen out, but that pump doesn't go in reverse. And is that time? That's time, 2.30. So all I have to talk about in uh, lab today is talk a little bit about that acid-base imbalances and then calories and temperature. Acid-base, calories, and temperature.